please be seated. Will you pray with me? O oh, Spirit of God, mighty fire, grow in us, burn in us until your radiance fills our soul. O oh, Spirit of God, mighty fire, may your heat consume our wills until we burn for you. And may the flames of your love ever blaze upon the altars of our hearts. Amen. Last week, uh, we talked about the book of Job and really had an introductory lesson. And I asked you, those of you who remember, to write down a question you would like answered through the course of moving through the book of Job. And we remember and catch up what's happened to Job. This man lost all that he owned in one day. And then a house fell upon ten of his children and killed them all. And then he broke out in what many believe to be smallpox. And he sits now in the ashes, miserable. And I asked you to write a question based upon that, and I will read the questions to you that you asked. This is the first time I've ever asked for questions and anybody ever wrote anything down, so I must not be doing such a good job now, but you're really going away confused. Question one, does God send suffering inflicted upon the children of God? Does he do that? And why would one person, number two, be sent so many hardships? Three, Scripture explicitly states that Job did not sin with his lips. What about sinning in his heart? My mother said Job's story is an example of character building. Can we have a great faith and still must go through this kind of character building? That's a good question. Five. Are the trials and tragedies planned by God to test us? Or are they supposed to drive us closer to God? Six. Does the stress of prolonged crisis often cause us to lose faith when the immediate threat of harm drives us to God? And finally, are Job's actions or inactions? A reasonable standard to expect from real people. Or are they something to which we might aspire? Or are they an idea that no one could possibly live up to? With questions like these, it is wonderful to be in a congregation like this that has those questions. Because you pretty much ask the questions that Job was asking. I think before we really begin, we need some definitions. We're going to throw out words, and we really need some meat behind those words. First of all, I want to underscore the difference between pain on one hand and suffering on the other. Pain is a biological, physiological term. You can ask Dr. Christie about pain. That's his department. It has to do with biochemistry and nerves and brains. But we are sure without pain, we 
we would destroy ourselves. Pain is a good thing. It lets us know something's going wrong. But suffering, on the other hand, is a psychological, philosophical, and theological term. It is not a biological term. Suffering takes the pain of the present moment and extends it into the future. And that extension is what causes us nightmares and suffering and tossing and turning into a bomb. It attacks us emotionally. Not only if it's physical pain, but it will bleed over into emotional pain, and then it will bleed into spiritual pain. And as far as scientists can determine, the human being is the only creation of the creation that can suffer. I know you may disagree with this. You're thinking about your dog. Your dog suffering. Human beings are the only creature with the abstract, symbolic, reasoning capability. You said, someone might say, well, I saw my dog suffering. No, what you saw was your dog in pain, and you projected that, and it is not cognizant of the future. I had a golden retriever. I thought the smartest animal on earth, but he never said one theological word to me. Heck of a retriever. Then we talk about physical pain, physical suffering, because of longevity. And then there is the emotional, psychological pain, which also leads to suffering in our lives. The psyche, translated from the Greek, psyche into soul. The seat of our emotions and our minds. Job lost all his means of revenue and his means of financial wealth. In one day, they killed all his camels, all the, they stole all his camels, all his donkeys, all his sheep, and all his oxen gone. In the blink of an eye, let us not paint Job to be a demigod above financial hardships. Financial hardships are real. And they can lead to a great amount of emotional suffering. When we do not know how we will feed our families, keep wounds over the heads of our families, let me tell you, it's more than just a momentary pain. It is a chronic emotional problem. And Job loses ten of his children. Is there anything worse to bring on worse emotional suffering in life, in, in life than the loss of a child? It can, and if we had ten of them to die, a whole family wiped out at once, would we not experience long-term suffering leading into depression and in some cases a psychotic break because our mind can no longer handle the excruciating pain created by loss. And then there is that which we might call spiritual pain. Those times, they come, it comes upon us. And there se appears to be no hope. Maybe the catalyst was long-term illness. Maybe the catalyst was loss. But it seems like there is no hope in life. It feels like we have been abandoned by God. And that life itself is an absurd thing without rhyme or reason. This 
listen to what Dr. Christie read in Job, the third chapter. Seven days Job did not speak. I'll address that next week. And about when he spoke, he cries out, I curse the day I was born. I curse the day I was conceived. It would have been better if I had been stillborn. Spiritual pain moves into spiritual suffering. And it seems that all hope has been lost. Isn't that what it said? Abandon all hope. Dante says, those who enter here are sickness unto death by care for God. It is this dismantling and destruction of our worldview, the way we think, think things work in life. It's spiritual suffering. Job suffers at all levels of his being. He has some friends sit with him. And during that time that they sit with him, they accuse him of having done something in his life. Otherwise, this would not have happened to him. Now we're getting down to the meat of the matter that some of you ask question. Theodicy, which is a fancy word for why do good people suffer. Where does it come from? Why did it happen to him? I love this stuff at once. And Job even asks the question, why is it happening to me? When there's a whole bunch of bad people out there, and there's nothing happening to them. Well, one answer we can give is cause and effect. The tectonic plates that form the world, the earth, they shift sometimes. And out in the deep of the ocean, a plate shift creates a wave, a tsunami that moves at a fantastic speed until it gets into shallow water and raises up almost a hundred feet in some cases and wipes out villages and towns and everything in its path. It's a cause and effect. The earthquake causes this tsunami which hits the villages. Pompeii. Pompeii was built five miles from an active volcano. Recent discoveries as they have gone through the city, the five miles from Mount Vesuvius, show that there are three layers of destruction. Not the one with which we are most familiar, but these people, after the volcano went off and destroyed it once, came right back and rebuilt upon that same ground, and then it got destroyed, and finally we get to the one we know, and they did it again. There's such thing, the pain comes out of ignorance. Not knowing. Ignorance is another reason for suffering. We just don't know. You know, we take so much for granted in medicine, in our doctors, our physicians. It's really a new, new. The way we practice medicine now is so brand new compared to how long we practiced in ignorance. I was reading about Joseph Lister. No, he didn't invent Listerine, but I guess it had something to do with him. His colleagues thought he was strange. He insisted upon 
washing his hair and his instruments to do surgery instead of the commonplace thing, which was to go from one patient to the next, wearing a white apron that looked like a butcher's apron after they finished cutting and sawing and hacking, never washing their hands and using the same instruments. To have surgery just about a little over 120 years ago meant you were going to die from this secondary infection. The king of England got appendicitis. That was a death sentence when the surgeons of that day opened you up in the intestines because some infection was going to be set loose. So they called up Joseph Lister and he told them to wash the instruments in carbolic acid. And then clean the wounds, clean your hands. And the king of England survived. And he got knighted for it. There was no ill intent in these physicians' motives. They just didn't know. And then another reason for suffering in the world is a word that we modern people don't like to hear. It's the S word. Sin. I've already been accused that we had to talk about evil the other week. I've already been accused of moving towards Baptist. Well, now we're really going to be at the accusation that I'm using the S word in the pulpit. And we thought it was going to be something else, didn't you? Some other word. Well, although the law of God was given in grace, that's what sets reform theology apart. The law was given in grace. With inside the law and following the law, you could govern yourselves and your relations to other human beings. To break the law that was given to us in grace to protect us from ourselves and to others brought forth calamity untold. In Job's story, some individuals wanted what Job had, so they went out and took it and killed all the servants. One of the things that so often we do not realize is that when we sin, it affects not only us, but it has a ripple effect throughout our culture, throughout our own family, throughout our society. Even if the sin is so private, it molds the perspective of morality within the individual. It is not an isolated incident. And finally, we come to what I would call the fourth one why people suffer. Now, the insurance company, you've got to picture this. The insurance companies say that when hurricanes come, tornadoes come, brush fires come, the insurance company puts on its theological hat and calls them acts of God. How strange is that? Smallpox, acts of God. No one was really responsible. A Sirocco comes across the wilderness, knocks down the, the children's house, and it kills every one of them. Why? Job asked. Why me? His friends. His friends represent so many of us that want to say, Job, you've got some unconfessed sin in your life. 
God is just, and since this stuff is happening to you, all these calamities, you must be the problem. And Job honestly examines his life, and he comes up with nothing. And his friends, as he sits in the ashes in this torment, to Job, you have missed something. So they begin to give him a litany of sins. And he checks them off, no, not that one. Not that one either. And on and on it goes. And he goes through the whole list. He's, they say, Job, you need then to ask God what your sin is, that you are punished so. He cries out to God in one of his speeches, Just show me, God, and I will repent. Just show me my error, the error of my ways, and I will bring myself back into the fold. And God, the thrust of the book of Job is to deconstruct a theology of quid pro quo. This for that. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. His friends believed it. Job even believed it. But the reason why people suffer is because they did wrong. The Jewish theological perspective, Job was written 500 years or so before Christ. That was the perspective. When bad things happened to you, you did it. Or you deserved it. When good things happened to you, you deserved it. The book of Job begins to take that apart. Dismantle that theology. Now we had 500 years, the Jewish community, by the time Christ comes, guess what? They didn't learn the lesson of Job. The disciples, his very own disciples said, Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born by? You know, maybe I speak too often of the current Christian mindset in the United States. The fastest growing churches are the ones that as long as you come to church here, you say your prayers, if you don't do bad things, you're going to be blessed. Everything is going to come out, come up roses. Everything. Blessing every week. A miracle every Sunday. I'll tell you what the miracle is that anybody can believe what they're putting out. It's a miracle. It's certainly not the miracle of Job. Today, we seem as Christianity, we haven't learned like the Jews haven't learned in the time of Christ and those in the time of Job haven't learned. It is not quid pro quo, this or that. The reasons for this theology are many, and you and I know it. It works better. It gives us a buffer from, from the pain and the suffering of other individuals if we can think that they did something to deserve it. And what we're really saying is we're afraid. We're afraid if that system is not intact, it might happen to us. And that's the purpose of Job is to change that way of thinking. That false perspective of God. Now, I haven't answered nearly all the questions. And probably, you're out there writing more. 
And this may go on ad infinitum into the next century. But I will revisit this next week and cover more. But I'll leave you with one question. As you struggle, as I've struggled with this book of Job, what sin did Jesus commit that he suffered so?